Five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to Engage 2.0. Welcome back to Engage 2.0. I am Brother Edie. And today we are going to be talking about repentance and confession. Repentance and confession. But um, for those who want to view those past episodes, you can go on to the YouTube channel. There, you can type in Heart to Heart 242. You can subscribe and hit the bell icon so you don't miss any more of our uploads. And also, if you want to contact us, you can do so via email at heart number two heart ministries242 at gmail.com once again it's heart two heart number two heart ministries242 at gmail.com and so also we have joining us along um, with our regular panelists um, brother Dion and sister Monica we have brother Colin brother Colin did you say hi to our listeners hello everybody how are you doing today glad to be here with you guys it's so great to have you join us, and we hope you are doing well. And now we're going to ask Brother Colin if you want to pray for us before we jump into this juicy topic for the day. Okay, that's no problem. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the blessings. We thank you for this opportunity that we can gather together to discuss your word. And we hope as we discuss that we be enlightened and also be encouraged. We pray that God will guide us and keep us. As we go through this challenging time and keep us strong that we may be in good health and that we keep praying for whatever situation that is happening that god will be the one to be victorious in the end this is my prayer in jesus name amen, amen. amen. all right amen. so it says repentance and confession there are some who at times endeavor to excuse sin this should not be when adam and eve sinned they made a choice we are free moral agents with the right of choice. We may choose right or we may choose wrong. All right, so let's answer these questions we have today, folks. Number one, to be forgiven of sin, what is necessary? To be forgiven of sin, what is necessary? You know what came to mind, right? Uh, uh, as I was looking in the book of Numbers, uh, we can just go to Numbers chapter 5. Uh, you know, God took the children of Israel out of Egypt, right? And bring them now into the wilderness. And we know that God set up the sanctuary for them, right? And now Exodus 28, 25 and verse 8 tells them that they make me a sanctuary. But here now, the concern, and, and we know that the sanctuary would portray the the i should say like the outline of how a man can be forgiven for him for his sins but as we go through the segment today we'll touch more on it but when i look at numbers five right and verse six and verse seven there's something there that god told the children of israel that they must do all right and it tells us it says if we have it we can read it, it says speak unto the children of Israel that's Numbers 5, 6 and 7 says speak unto the children of Israel when a man or woman right, shall commit any sin that men commit to do a trespass against the Lord and that person be guilty it says then they shall confess their sin which they have done and he shall recompense his transgression, his trespass, with the principle thereof. And I just want to stop there. So it tells us that if we trespass or if we sin against God, we must confess our sins to him. There's no other person we can confess our, our sins to for God Almighty, right? And we know, we understand that that person is also in, uh, uh, who 
who plays that role as our mediator is Christ Jesus. Because he is a part of the Godhead. We confess our sins to him, and he is the one uh, who, uh, who who we sin against. It's true. It's because of him. Um, let us go to First John one nine, and um, the, the scripture here says to be forgiven of sin. Uh, uh, the question is to be forgiven of sin. What is necessary? As you brought up the point, right? Um, the person, yeah. the man or woman who transgressed against um, the law of God, they are in the restitution. But let, let's look at it mm -hmm. from um, the New Testament. First John one nine. And it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, now, right. there's a there, there's a word there that stuck out to me reading this, and it says, he, not not he. them, right? Not it, but he. So who is he referring to here? The he, the he is Jesus. In the in the text, the the text, um, First John seven, it said, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we are fellowship one with another and the blood of jesus christ his son cleanses us from all sins then yeah. it goes saying if we say that we have no sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in him so mm. in nine it says if we confess our sins he is faithful we're just talking about jesus in the text first john seven so that he is jesus now you know, go ahead, go, Brother Colin, you had a point? Go ahead. I, I, I like where we're going with this, but um, there's something I want us to, to focus on. There's two um, things that come to my mind as we think about what is necessary to be done for us to be forgiven for sin. The first thing is I thought about is Genesis chapter 3 and verses 1 to 5. The whole circumstances of why we are in this predicament, which is because of Adam and Eve, and they decided they did not listen to God, and they fall into temptation, and they actually decided to sin. Right. Another thought that came to my mind, just before the text that you read just now, First John chapter 1, verse 9, there's a text right before that. If you read it, it says um, 1 John chapter 8. I don't know, my thing right there. I'm trying to put it back up. If you can tell it, it's 1 John chapter 8. 1 John chapter 8. Yes. And then 1 John. 1 verse 8. Voice one, one yeah. So if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Yes. So right then and there, we realize that we are deceiving ourselves. We don't have sin. Mm -hmm. The first thing that we need to do is first recognize that we have fallen, mm -hmm. and that Savior. And once we recognize that we need a Savior, we also have to realize that there's a penalty for our sin, and the penalty is that someone has to die. Mm -hmm. That's why sanctuary messages came about because someone has to die right. for our penalty. Right, right. And that's where it says the basis of sin is what? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Somebody has to pay the price. So Jesus, he, the one who said he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, had to come and that had to stand in place. He had, right from the very beginning, that was put in the, in Genesis chapter 1, I mean Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 to 5, the Lamb. We understand this Lamb to be Jesus Christ. This lamb had to be, this lamb had to be sacrificed, had to die. Today, we are now getting ready to celebrate that period, or the world is getting ready to celebrate that period, I should say, where the Savior has to be put on the cross and die for God's sake. If that not happen, then guess what? We carry our own penalty. Right. Correct. First thing we need to know, first thing necessary need to be done, and Jesus did it from the very beginning put a substitute for our sins and he was that substitute yes. someone had to die that's the necessity of our sins someone has to die um, and guess what jesus said to us why should we die when you offer us life right yeah you know it's a valid point because um let's look at david's situation i don't bring that to light because here now is it's the dynamics we we're talking about um confession and repentance and how they go hand in hand um let's look at psalm 51 verse 
one, and we're going to go through four. Sounds 51. Sounds chapter 51 from one to four. Again, it says, to the chief musician, a psalm of David. It says, when Nathan the prophet came unto him, after he had gone into Bathsheba, and that kind of, the, I mean, you could use the imagination on that, on that, that passage right there. <laughs> Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. According unto the multitude of thy tender mercies blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Now we just looked at 1 John 1, 9. And as Sister Monica rightly said, according to scripture, Jesus Christ is that, is, that, is that lamb, as Brother Carlin brought up, that would take away our sins and cleanse us from these things as what David here is speaking of. And then it says, For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Isn't it beautiful? Yes. In all state, I have not known sin, but by what? The law. The law. Yes, the law show me. And the law show him if he was covetous, the law will show him that. So the law is like a mirror. Let's say if let's say if you're looking beholding your image in a in a mirror, in a looking glass, and that mirror shows you that there's something wrong with your parents. And that's why you have them. The mirror shows you, hey, you got something stuck in your teeth or your hair is not combed or you have something on your shirt when, when you don't have anybody there to tell you these things. You have a mirror in your household to show you that there's something wrong with your parents. But can the mirror help you do something about that appearance? No. You have to actually do something to make their parents what you want it to be. In this case, David is saying, the law have, have showed me my transgressions and I acknowledge them. And he says, it is before me. And now watch this. Watch verse 4. I love this. Against thee, the only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. So it's, it's, it's telling us that only the Lord himself was the person whom David offended. Because it was his law that spoke about thou shalt not kill. He made yes. Uriah, right. Uriah up to be slaughtered. To only to covet or to take or to steal his wife. Right. And, the, and, and we can see as, as David uh, um, talked about what he had done, he acknowledged he didn't, he didn't say, well, you know, I'm the king. I could do what I want. I got the money. I got the power. But he, he, when the prophet brought the, the point home to him, he realized that what he had concocted in his mind that there was a god in heaven who already found out his plan and the right. lord sent the prophet unto the the offender of the law and said i know what you have done and you have uh um, dirty hands in fact the lord told david personally you're not going to build my temple you're not going to build the no no you have blood upon your hands you see it, it, it tells us then that the law here that Adam and Eve were given in the garden to help keep them in the confines from the evil malicious plans of the enemy. This was the protective barrier, that hedge around them to keep them from evil. Because now once you transgress God's law, it demands blood. Hence it yes. says, the day that thou eatest, thou shalt die. That act that they did in the garden brought upon them the penalty for, for, for breaking that law. In fact, let me, let me make it a little bit more um, um, practical. Um, there are some countries now exercising uh, laws of the land because of the COVID-19. And what happens yes. when persons go against that law or they break the curfew or they are found outside uh, uh, in, a, in, in areas where they're not supposed to be? Then the government will then punish the, the transgressor of that particular law. Yes. And so just like the laws of the land have their laws and ways in which to govern and to and to um to to, to, to to penalize persons once they transgress the laws of the land, you don't think God God has ways to dealing with those who break his moral law? Yeah, that's that's very true. So just like how the the laws of the land have its laws to help protect its citizens, God has his laws to protect our souls from the destruction of the enemy. And, and this is why, through the sanctuary system, we can find 
that Christ, once we um, ask forgiveness for the sins and the things that we have done wrong in our lives, He says, I will cleanse you from that. In fact, when I cleanse you, I'm going to take your sins and cast them from you, that you will not have to keep bearing them upon your shoulder. This is why it says, take my yoke upon you, because my yoke is easy. Why? Because His job is to present us before the Father how? Faultless. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So when we try to do it ourselves, when we try, as Adam and Eve did in the garden, try to mend for themselves um, 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 aprons of, of light, right. it's not going to work. We're in other words, we try to cover our sins. Yeah, exactly. We're trying to show yes. as righteous, self-righteousness. But God sees us as naked. Why? Because we don't have the means to shield off the, the penalty from that sin we have done. I, I, right. Edie, I, 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 I want to add something here, and I'm, I'm going to go back to Romans chapter 6, and I want to play this thought in our mind. Um, Romans chapter 6, verse 21, it says, What fruit had he then in those things whereof we are ashamed of? Shame now, uh, now, I mean, are now ashamed of. For the end of those things is death. We all know that sin... The end of sin is death. But God said, I want to give you something better. He said, he said, he goes back on verse 22. But now we may free from sin and become in service to God. Ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. See, God is not just saying be free of sin. He's trying to tell you, I want to offer you something too. I want to take you from sin. I want to give you everlasting life. So why are we fighting everlasting life and staying in sin? It, it bothers me. So the question is, you ask it, what's the necessary forgiveness? And the very necessary is somebody has to die. It goes, to, it ends. In that same chapter, Romans chapter 6, verse 23, it ends. For the wages of sin is death. You can't get around it. Someone right. has to die. Right. But the right. of God is eternal life. By God mm -hmm. himself on the cross, he has given us eternal life, so why are we wanting to die in sin? Well, let me answer that question, yeah. let me answer that question with verse 5 of Psalms 51. And I think it will help. Go ahead. I think, Sister Monica, you, you addressed it uh, in our last um, broadcast. And it says here in verse 5, Psalms 51, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity. In, iniquity. Yeah. in yeah. sin did my mother conceive me. So here now lies the crux of the matter. Because we are so prone to sin, it seems uh, as if we are being, it's, it's almost as if someone is taking candy away from a baby. But that candy, in that candy lies cavities. In that candy lies uh, a, a weakened immune system. But we think because how it looks and how it might taste, sin is so sweet. Yes. And we think it's so good. This is just how demoralized the, the, the human race has become because of sin. And we think the bad things are good. But the, and the good things are bad is like drinking sorosy here in the uh, here where we live in this part of God. Some some people might know what it is, but there's a bush called sorosy, and and we take that bush when when <laughs> as, as remember as as long as I can remember. But it 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 was a it it was supposed or it, it was given to me uh, uh, from my mom to help me whenever I was feeling sick or ill. But it tasted so bad. <laughs> you understand? It tasted right. So bad. But in that bitter yeah, herb, go ahead. But in that bitter herb lies healing, lies restitution, yeah. lies strength yeah. and mobility of my mind. But this, this is this is what Satan tries to present salvation as something that is bitter, something that when you take it, you're gonna miss out on the fun and and the good things in this life, and the things of this life. And he makes salvation look so bitter, and he makes sin look so sweet. That it, 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 when we try to when we try to do the things that God wants us to do, the the world will rub hard against you because the principles that lies therein are that of the enemy, and we can't see. Yeah. And this is why we loathe salvation. We loathe things godly. We loathe it. And, and rightfully so, because scripture says that the world did not know Jesus. Right. Yeah. And, 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 it, and it says it behoove him to be made like his brethren. Why? Because he realized that this race are so sin ridden 
tell it I mean, it's like it was so amazing to him that we just don't understand it and even his own people the jews in his day did not understand who christ was or they failed to want to understand but it, it, just, right. shows, it just shows us that sin is so I, I can't even find a word for it because it, if, if he doesn't deal with it he will cease to exist well yeah Eddie, I want you, you know you know, there there is no other way to describe sin other than just hideous, you know. And when we first acknowledge that, uh, when it comes to sin, uh, just looking back at verse at, at the first question, I just was looking at it carefully, you know. And it says to be forgiven for sin, what is necessary, right? One, we 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 just was looking at when we acknowledge sin, right? Uh, with, with David, how um, uh, the prophet came there. Uh, Gave him the Bible and he recognized his sin. One thing I understand is when you recognize that sin, you must feel guilty for that sin. Yes. When you feel guilty for that sin, then there is, uh, uh, there is a way now for you to be forgiven for that. Because you recognize there's something that you have done that was a great error or that's something that you have done that would bring a, a result of death, like you said, Brother Colin, that for the wages now of your sin is death, but you must now feel guilty for the sin you have committed. This is how the, the forgiveness is, is being given. Because some people sin, and they just go walk on with their merry business, continuing with their daily lives, having no guilt, you know, no acknowledgement that they sin. <laughs> I want to explore that some more, but that's in question number eight, and I don't want to come with that. So, <laughs> I, I know this. Because I, I want to, I want to, I want to play on that because that's very important. Um, but let's yes. The second question, as we build upon this rock, this foundation. Go ahead. So, who is sin to be confessed? And we talked about um, acknowledging your sin, but once you acknowledge right. your sin, who are they to be confessed to? Once I sin, I like to confess that to the person I have hurt. Uh, or do I confess unto God? Because as we look at Psalm 51, David says, Against thee, thee only. Right. He had wrong, Him you only. He had, wrong, he had wrong Uriah's house. So it would have been Uriah and his family. He should have been confessing too, but he didn't do that. He says, Against thee, because why? It was God's law that says, Thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. And so, uh, yeah. so these are the laws here that God put in place for his people in God. And I, I love and I love this fact. Um we are looking at the fact that if he then did a heinous act towards a family and he says only against God he had wrong or sin, then that means that tells me that there's no man I need to confess to. That's right. Two five says this. Psalms thirty two and verse five. Verse five. Says this. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and my iniquity have I not have. I have I not hid? I said I will confess mm -hmm. my transgressions unto the who? Unto the Lord. Unto the Lord. And thou forgivest the iniquity of my sin. So first of all. I David acknowledged his sin, but he confessed it to who? Man? To the Lord. Did he confess it to Lord? No man. Hold on. Did he confess it to Nathan the prophet? No. 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 Not even the prophet. And to the Lord. And, and who else forgave him of that sin? God. God did. He said, yeah, that be God. How forgave us the iniquity of God's sin? So it tells me, as a man, when I went, I break the, the law of God, I don't go to no man. I go directly to God. Now, when God right. says we are to confess our faults to one another, that's a different story. Because mm -hmm. if I did something that goes against the moral code, because remember, the commandments are set up in, in, in two fashions. One, you have the first four commandments that relate to God. The last six commandments relate to how our relationship to God. Hence why he says there are two commandments, and people says that there's only two commandments. But he says, here are the two commandments that you hang everything on. One, you have mm -hmm. the Lord that relates to God. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And the second is like unto it, love the neighbor as thyself. So once we realize that we are 
we are uh, we have broken the moral code the moral law of god then we had obligation to say to our neighbors sorry for scratching your car for breaking your window blah 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 but the uh -huh. sin the sin sorry for stealing your whatever your money but the, 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 the guilt and the, and, and the condemnation for breaking that law does not lie with your neighbor. He cannot forgive you for a law that God put in place. God himself has to forgive you for that. In fact, let's make that clear. Go to Exodus chapter 32, verse 33. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord, peradventure, I shall make an atonement, love that word, for your sin. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of the book which thou hast written. And, and the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath what? Sin. Sin against me. Him will I blot out of my book. So that God himself can forgive you for any transgression you have done to his law. No man can do that because God himself, as Moses rightly said, in a book. And only God himself can write it and only God himself can remove it. Whatever law, whatever law the Ten Commandments you have broken, only he can make it right in his book. And I love that because it shows that no man can do that. The prophet couldn't do that. David himself couldn't do that. He had to ask God for forgiveness of that sin that his name will not be blotted out. And it's, and it's right. important to us to understand this point because a lot of people are being misled into thinking they have to go into a booth and confess their sins to a human being. Which, which, a mercy. Which place only God himself has the right to do. No man. Right. He gave no disciple that, that prerogative. So, so that means, uh, in other words, when a man claims uh, that he can forgive sins, would that be portraying that he is claiming divinity? Is he claiming that he has divine laws himself? That yes. mankind would have transgressed? That's what he's saying. That's, yeah. That's exactly wow. what Because if, 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 if I go into a, 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 any booth or any, any little box and, and ask uh, a human being to forgive me of the deepest, darkest secrets of sins that I have done, and they say, your sins be forgiven, but who are you to forgive me of that? Wow. The laws that I've transgressed is not anything of a human nature. These these laws that were tra uh, tra uh, written with the finger of God on two occasions. I, but Edie, I, I think I, can find, I found a text that I want to share with you on that note. Uh, say Mark chapter 2, verse 7. They say, why doest this man speak blasphemy? Who can forgive sin but God only? And this is um, this is this is them speaking about Jesus Christ, the scribes. And they said, "How could Jesus say?" But there was there was a certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their heart. Why does this man speak? And that's the voice before us, voice six, speak blaspheming. So they call it saying Jesus was blaspheming, and they say, "Who can forgive sin but God only?" So is is they know right from the beginning that only God have that prerogative to forgive sin. And that's why when you, you know, it goes straight to the very beginning, you know. And if you look at Genesis chapter 3, I want to see something that Satan brought to the, to, um, to, um, Adam and Eve. I mean, to Eve, not Adam, but to Eve. He said something rather peculiar. And we sometimes overlook it. And I want you to, I want us to think about that a little bit more. And it goes back to Genesis chapter 3, verses, um, chapter 3, verse 5. It says, For God do us know that in the day he eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and he will be as be as a God. So the thing is, man are still trying to be like God. They want to take yeah. the, the position of God. And if you go to Lucifer, uh -huh. you go to, um, I think it's Isaiah, I think, where he said he wanted to put himself above the Most High. And mm -hmm. <laughs> This people, we have to realize that it, 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 it hasn't changed, you know, from Genesis. Satan is still trying to get above the most high. Oh, yeah. Telling yeah. man the same thing. They try to get above the most high. And until we realize that, 
did Satan want to be God? Yeah. And guess who's telling God? Tell him man, you are God. Uh, you're not. We need uh, to say that we are not God. Only uh, God can forgive man's sins. Only God died on the cross and paid the penalty for our sins. You know, but a comment right. even more important than that. Um, we, we alluded to Matthew chapter 25 verse 41 that talks about hellfire that is prepared for the devil and his angels and, and, yes. what, and what that little diversion does uh, from, from confessing to God to confessing to man what that does is that take the sins that's supposed to go upon the lamb yes yes it diverts it somewhere else so when you confess in it and it's not and it's not going in its proper place that's like if, you, if you, that's like if you have an empty wrapper after you finish eating something and you throw it on the ground it doesn't go into the trash bin and then the tr then the trash collector comes and they take it to where all the trash goes so they could you know deal with it um the way it needs to be dealt with but if you throw that um that trash or whatever it can end up somewhere harming some kind of or causing some kind of um problem in the environment you know, some uh, an animal may you know choke or die or suffocate from the rap or whatever have you, and because it didn't go in its proper place, and if if the sin doesn't go upon the lamb, then it cannot be, it, then it cannot be removed from the individual, and then the individual is thinking when I go into this booth and confess my sin to a man, that the man he he cannot take away that that penalty from me because it's still not upon where it's supposed to go. First uh, John two one says this, my little children, these things I write unto you, that ye right. sin not. And if yes. any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Who's this advocate? Let's find out. Sir. Jesus Christ, the righteous. Amen. And, and he, Amen. Is the creation for our sins, and not, not. And not for ours only, but also for the what? Yeah. The sins of the whole world. Of the world. Wow. Isn't that awesome? To know Amen. That, the Amen. that Jesus came to do for when John said, Behold the Lamb of God that take away what? The sin of the world. Yes. It did not change. It did not yes. point to Peter. It did not point to John, the revelator. It did not point to Thomas. Or Matthew, the tax collector. He didn't point the doctor. Neither Paul. Neither Paul, the apostle. He pointed to Jesus. And it didn't Hello? change. And it still is Jesus Christ who is responsible for taking our sins away from us and cleansing us from our unrighteousness. No one can do that. No entity on this planet can do that. Only but he, can cleanse. But he, he, I, you brought up uh, something there that we have, I don't want to surpass. When we do not confess our sins and make a turnaround in our life, our sins remains. Oh, oh wow. Oh, yes. Uh, it remains. Our sins remains. This is mm -hmm. why we still have people out there today doing the tedious crimes and living the way they're living. Because right. even when they go to the church and they confess in their sins, they're not getting no relief. The burden is still there. The separation is still there. Something is still missing in their life. This is why we have the addict is still on their drugs because guess what? They need a fulfillment. The fulfillment is Jesus Christ. He's the oh, one yes. who takes away the sin. He's the one who takes away the penalty. Am I? Yes. I think what we missing here is that when Adam and Eve tried to cover themselves themselves, they were trying mm -hmm. to be God. Mm -hmm. And the sin yeah. remains. Yes. Jesus, when, he, when God came out there and God said, Adam, well, thou, he, he asked enough for a reason. Because he told them, I can help you. Mm -hmm. I can yeah. save you. I can take away your sin. I will die for you. And yeah. this is this is why we have the problem today. We are trying to be God, and mm. God can save us. Save us, amen. Yeah, and I like the words of Jesus Himself when He said that He would be the one to take away our sins. Uh, Matthew yeah. eleven. Verse 28, he just simply says, Say, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and then you will find rest for your souls. Amen. Each and every day, people are running to and fro, hoping to, to be relieved from the burden of sin. It's, 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 it's weighing down on them so dramatically that, and, and I think that this is what probably might impress them to go to a man 
when a man claim that you forgive sins because mm-hmm. if this door is open hey just come right in i can relieve you of your sins and you just go right on mary but that's the thing when they go right on mary they continue right back in the same sense they that they've been doing and then that man is open there again for them to come right back and let's just keep doing the same thing on over because they're they're still confessing that same sin to that man and that's mm-hmm. the, the the words that he they, that a man would probably tell them just continue and come back to me mm-hmm. once i give you an affirmative that your sins are forgiven then you're good but christ tells us you got to come unto me not unto man that's right that's why he says that his burden is his yoke is easy and easy. it's light easy uh-huh. see when you come to him you won't go back to him again for for to, for that same sin again you know why because christ victory. will give you the strength uh-huh. he will give you the strength for that sin that you confess and prayed for which you were so guilty of yeah that you will now gain the victory as you continue going on through life and you will see yourself overcoming daily amen and that same sin that you that same sin that you've been committing you find yourself saying Whoa, I haven't did this in a while. Wow. God, you know, God is good. That's where Amen. all praise and glory go unto Him. Amen. That's how you truly can experience that His yoke is easy. You have to put God to the test. Yes, yes. You got to prove His word. The, Not test, but prove His word. His word is, is proven. The other thing I want to highlight um, on Brother Colin's point um, about irony. Mm-hmm. Immediately when the law was broken, there was a separation between God and man. That's right. Oh, yeah. There was a separation. And here lies the, the heart of the matter. Sin and the product of sin cannot exist in a sight of a holy God. And when Adam and Eve ate the fruit that they were not supposed to eat of, it brought an immediate separation between God and that which he had created. This is what it says in Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2. And it says... Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot say it, neither his ear heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins and his sins and his face from you. Here now it tells us that once we do not once we once we sin against God, we do not have God in our midst. Because he cannot be in the presence of sin. This is the no. whole point of the sanctuary. The sanctuary was to show God's people how he will dwell with them. Not while being in the lifestyle of sin, but when they exercise what God has given them in the product of the sanctuary service, how they will go through the service and the rituals and the rites to see that it's the blood of Jesus Christ who would be um, um, for the future as Right. Who will fulfill the blood of that lamb to take away the sin and to cleanse us from our filthiness and unrighteousness? This is the whole plan of salvation. Yes, He wants to save us from sin, salvation, but also He wants us to be locked in that state of holiness and purity. Hence, why in Revelation chapter 22 it tells us that He who is filthy will be filthy. Filthy, filthy, still. filthy still. Because your sins still remain yeah. upon you. Oh he who is holy will be holy still. Why? Because you are sanctified through the blood of the Lamb. And those oh who will live righteously will continue to live righteously. And those who do not want Christ will continue to live ungodly. And this is oh what we need to understand, people, our spiritual state of mind. Are we living a life of victory over sin? Or are we con- daily trying to <laughs> cleanse ourselves from an unrighteousness. And I love the way our brother Dion said wow. because immediately when he read that text, Brother Dion, my mind went on Martin Luther. My mind went on wow. trying to climb up these steps on his knees, trying to try yeah. to cleanse himself from the wrong things he had done. But he couldn't do it. Uh-huh. Why? The, 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 and I sure it was an angel who brought back to his mind the just shall live by faith. 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 faith in what? Faith in what the Son of Man would do upon the cross of Calvary for us. Because we so have to play in that outside of confessing our sins. That's it. That's the only part we play. And we have to, by faith, understand and know that when we ask Christ for forgiveness, He will do it. 
We don't have to beat ourselves, whip ourselves, and keep mourning over the sins of the past. Once I ask God forgiveness for for stealing, for lying, for fornication, all these other things, God says, "I will forgive you that." Now you have to believe and walk in the faith that you are cleansed. Right. And now we're gonna go to our short break. See you right on the other end of this break. Welcome back to Engage 2.0. If you're joining us, um, you're just tuning in on um, our next topic discussion, which is repentance and confession, which is very, very awesome. And we are continuing on in the topic of salvation. And so far, we talked about um, how do we find or what is necessary for um, repentance. And we also looked at when we need to confess our sins too. And it's none other than Jesus Christ. And so before we get into the next question, uh, Dion, you had a point you wanted to make. Yeah, you made a, a wonderful point about Martin Luther, you know, seeing him climbing those steps and 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 working his way, try, at least trying to work his way to, to gain acceptance or salvation from Christ or gain that, that uh, comfort that Christ would give. You know, in Galatians 5 and verse 1, right? It tells us something so beautiful. Because when someone uh, live in sin and they acknowledge their sin and they go to Christ and say, you know, Christ, I acknowledge my sin and I want forgiveness. Christ's words, is, he forgives and he pardons. But Galatians 5, 1, right? It tells us something with, that we don't have to live in sin no more. Like It's like giving you a ticket Right? And you're relieved from, 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 from doing something all your life, and you don't have to do it no more. It's like he gave you the okay. Okay, you could just stop doing this. But let me, let me just read what the scripture says. It says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith, wherewith Christ had made us free, and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. So we see that when a person sin, right? The reason why they keep going to the priest or keep going to a man is because the sin was never re, was never uh, 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 resolved. Mm. The sin was never resolved mm. and you never receive words of comfort or encouragement. Yeah, this tells me that I don't even have to sin no more because the Bible tells me that Christ would give me liberty from it. Mm. He give me liberty not to sin. Amen. So that and that's because based on his power, based on his power, holding on to the faith of what he have done. I now can walk free without sinning, without being a slave to it. Amen. Daily. No. Christ telling me daily I can overcome if I go hold on to his power. Hold on to his righteousness. And that's 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 the, the, the thing I've seen how we can overcome daily. Holding Amen. on to him. Amen. Um, let's look at our third question. What must accompany a true confession of sin? What must accompany a true confession of sin? Um, there's a text that um, I want to read. It comes from Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 13. Proverbs 28 and 13. And here's what it says. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. So it, it tells me that if I try to hide and I, I go back and I actually can use that text in the example of Adam and Eve, when they try to cover themselves with the fig leaves, they try to cover their nakedness, they try to cover their guilt and shame because, you know, Adam said, I, I, I was naked and I hid, you know, he was ashamed. But it tells us that once we sin and we transgress the laws of God, there's shame and guilt and all these other things that accompany these things. Um, and right. I, I, I go back to persons who have um, children outside of wedlock. There is, some, there is sometimes, especially in some cultures, there is guiltiness brought upon that act because you having a baby outside of wedlock and you, you know, you, everybody know you're fornicated. You know, and so they try to marry. Sometimes there's a gunshot wedding. Sometimes they try to marry to make the act that was done right in the sight of people right. trying but, to justify it exactly but here's the thing you can do that to bring some kind of satisfaction to your mind but at the end of the day 
it's God who says you should not do these things. And once you do these things, it's God who you should say, Lord, forgive me for that act of fornication. And once you wow. ask God for that, you don't have to marry someone who you may be miserable with for the rest of your life just to try to make something look good in the sight of man. It is God whom we are to please. It is God we have to so ourselves approved of. So at the end of the day, um, even though we do try to do righteous things or to try to do things to make it look good, to cover it up, at the end of the day, like, um, like David said, it's against God that we sin. And it's his law that's going to be, um, uh, that needs to be um, justified. So at the end of the day, um, it tells us that all we got to do is go to God. All we have to do, in yeah. fact, I love, I love Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, I think oh, yeah. it is. Hebrews the fourth chapter because it tells us that we can come to who? God. How? Boldly. Not boldly. rudely, not disrespectfully. We can come to him boldly and boldly. he will take away our sins. He will hear us. But if we try to cover our sins, uh, it will not be right for us because at the end of the day, you know, we still have a record in heaven. And it says in verse 4 of Hebrews 4, I'm um, sorry, Hebrews 6, Hebrews 4, 16, it says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. Notice that throne of what? Grace. That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. So it tells us that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. All we have to do is go to Jesus. We have to go to him and confess our wrongs. And like, like it was said in 1 John 1, 9, He is so faithful and so just, He will forgive us. There's no penance we need to pay, but there, there's no works we have to do. We, there's no um, act of, 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 of things that we have to continue to do or to jump through hoops. God says, just ask. Ask. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it shall I be given. To take you back to something you open up with. Um, and we talk about David, and you know, we can talk about Cain, how he tried to cover his sin. And God say, I hear the blood of Abel crying out. And David, when he put you eye in the front line, and and you go, you read earlier this day, um, Psalms chapter 51. And I want you to go back to something where it says, and you just talk about mercy. David, you know, when you sincere about what you have done wrong, you come to God this way. And David come like this and say, Have mercy unto me, O Lord, according to your love and kindness, mm -hmm. according unto the multitude of thy tender mercy, blood of my transgression. Then you go to the the voice. Chapter 9, verse 9, 51, verse 9, he said, Hide thy face, hide thy face from my sin, and blot out all my iniquity, created me a clean heart, O Lord, and renew a right uh. with me. You have to have that need that you need a Savior. You have yeah. to know that you are lost. You have to see that you need help. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Go ahead, Dion. The that. Yeah, you, you know, when, when you said if, if any man were to cover up his sin, right? <clears throat> you know, the verse that came to my mind was Isaiah 29, verse 15. It's a profound scripture, right? Mm -hmm. And it says, Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsels far from the Lord, and their works are in the dark, and they say, Who sees us and who knows us? And then when you jump to, to Hebrews, I, I was looking at, at it, right? And I was like, wow, that's it there. I was like, look at verse 15. If, if, you're, if your Bible is still in Hebrews 4 and verse 13, sorry, not 15, 13, look at what it says. It says, neither is there any creature that is not manifested in his sight, mm. but all things are naked wow. and open <laughs> unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. There's nothing we can hide from God. Nothing. nothing. You See, that's why David had to had to confess his sin in such a way because yep. God saw it all. That's right. You know, he, 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 you know just, just, just looking back at what David did, um, causing Uriah to go in the front line of battle, to die there in, in, in war, so, yep. to hide the, sin, the grievous sin that he'd done. It, it, it did not... It was not hid from God's eye. God saw it. Mm -hmm. He saw every every plan that David made. So and that's why he had to send the prophet Nathan. Exactly. Yes. Because what happens then, Sister Monica, I know you're the point. I'm coming to you right now. Uh, because 
what happens then is God was trying to do him a favor. Actually, God did him a favor because yeah, he sent the he prophet did. there because if David had died in that state, he would be lost. Yes. Lost. He would be lost. lost. All right, go ahead, Sister Monica. Well, I was about to say that um, even though you sin, God is faithful and just to forgive you of your, all your sins, no matter if it, if you think on it big, small, wretched, there is no big or small sin. And he still extends his hand out to you and with, with a hand of mercy and grace. The void that we try to fill sometimes with the things of this world, with partying and drinking and getting married yeah. and all these different things, it's a void we're trying to fill. And only yeah. one, 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 one person can fill that void, and that's Jesus. Mm-hmm. And that's the oh, void, yes. that's the void that, is held, that is missing from you. You cannot, you cannot fill it with all those things and then come back right back to reality and think that, oh, I'm still in my stress, I'm still in my anxiety, I'm still in my depression. It's, be- it's because you're filling it with all the wrong things. That's right. And yeah. Jesus is saying, come to me, all you are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. Take my hope upon you. He's, he's, he's extending the hand, even though we might leave him, he's still there saying, come to me, my, my, he's my, my lost. He's saying, come to me, my, my, my weary child. Just like the prodigal son, he ran out, he squandered all his father's goods, with, he had for him, and he came to him sense, to a sense, and said, look at me, I came from all his riches and all his glory, and I left for my own lust, my own, my own yeah. pride. And... Yeah. I come to my senses now that I have had all these things. Let me go back to my father and ask forgiveness and humble myself and say to my father, I am not worthy of you taking me back, but will you keep me yeah. as a hired servant? And that's what Jesus wants us to do, to come to him, acknowledge our sins, and say to, say to him, Father, forgive me. For I have sinned against yeah. thee Amen. and thee alone. Right. You know, right. you know. That's where uh, sin abound, grace, grace did much more abound. The, the thing is, the thing is with the parable with the last son is this, is that the father didn't need any excuse. The father embraced him irregardless. And, and yeah. this, and this is what we have to understand, that God is so loving us. He, listen, listen carefully to Romans 5, 8. And I said before in this program, it's one of my favorite verses. It says, while we were yet sinning against God, he died for us. Amen. There's nothing we can do to be good in God's sight. There's no works you have to do. You don't have to make yourself pretty in the sight of God. He knows your darkness. He knows the things that you've been through. He knows what you are going through. Because scripture says that he is the author and the finisher of our faith. So everything he knows, there's nothing we can bring to him. To make him love us. He loves us anyway. You know, sometimes we, we see persons on the road and they might be, you know, had a hard um, um, lot in life and they might smell about what whatnot. And sometimes we pass up our noses and don't want nothing to do with them. And sometimes they may need a little help. And we, you know, we screw up our windows or try to drive past when the light on red or they try to pull up some more. But guess what? They, they didn't, end, they didn't, they, they weren't born like that. They were That's once, right. they were once someone's beautiful baby boy or girl. You understand? They, were, they, 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 they once had, had hope and, 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 and a future. And sometimes things happen. And sometimes God allows certain things to happen to, for us to exercise mercy and compassion towards one another because He's compassionate towards us. He didn't have to die for us. He could have let us die to the penalty that we, which we deserve. But He ransomed Himself. Do you understand? Do you understand the, the, the magnitude of His actions towards an erring people? I mean, just look at his relationship to Israel. You understand? Who was more wayward and, and stubborn than them set of people? But yet, he loved them so much that he died for them. Yeah. And not that just for them, because we have served from Scripture that well, not only, he died for us as well. The, world. the entire world. That none should perish. In fact, there's a text, there's a text that, that um, someone find it for me, please, that none should perish to come to repentance. I, I need to find that text. I need to read that into record. That all should come to repentance. That's our uh, second Peter three nine. Yeah, let's let's read that. Let's let's read that. It says that the Lord second Peter three nine. It says the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that 
all should come to repentance. To repentance. This is the Savior we serve, my brothers, my sisters, yeah. my friends, my enemies, whoever they may be. I don't know. I hope I don't have any enemies, but if I do, God came to save I said save the same thing you. one morning when I was praying. <laughs> You know, I, I, I pray, you know, Lord, I don't know if I have any any enemies, but I, I pray for my enemies to be saved too. But if they if there are any, you know, reveal them to me so I can tell them Jesus loved them. I tell you, I, I don't know who my enemies are. You understand? <laughs> but as, Whoever they are. <laughs> but, I mean, it is, so, it is such a great magnitude to know that there's a loving Savior in heaven who doesn't need oh, yes. us to put on a show or doesn't need us to be clean. You know, some people say, and I can wait till I get it right. Let me tell you something, you will never get it right. You will never get to a place of perfection, never. Because Job himself, Job himself had no idea with the conversation between um, Satan and, and God. And how, how people, how, you know what's a baffle me? I just want to stop and say this. How people don't realize that Satan exists and there's a conversation between God and, and, and Satan over Job? Over you. You understand? Over you. I, 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 don't, I don't get it. But nonetheless, Job himself had no idea that this conversation was going on. And God said, this servant of mine is perfect in all his ways. Perfect. God himself wow. deemed us perfect. But Job, as far as he knew, he wasn't perfect. He just couldn't figure it out. But at the end of the day, my friends, it tells us that we don't have... To, to, to do anything outside of confess our sins and live in the righteousness of Christ. That is it. Amen. That is it. That is the whole crux of the matter. And God has given us the strength in His Son that we don't have to rely on our strength. I don't have to, I don't have to do it right. But God says, just come to me and I'll do it for you. And that's Amen. the promise yeah. He gives us. And that's so sweet. I, I, wish, I wish everybody could understand how sweet it is. But that's, that's the whole formula. Trust in the Lord and He will take care of that because that's what He came to do in the first place. If we could have done it, it would have been done by Adam and Eve. If it, if, it, if it could have been done, it could have been done by them, but it couldn't. This is why the second Adam came on the scene. To overcome and to go over the same ground as what the first Adam failed. And it's only through Christ. This is why He is our propitiation because He's the only one who lived a sanctified just life on earth. Through his spirit. Exactly. So right. only through that, his through his spirit. spirit have to mingle with flesh. Amen. Right? That has and that's Amen. where that's where faith and works come hand in hand. Amen. Ephesians two verses eight through nine says, For by grace we are saved. Through that's Ephesians two verses eight to nine. For by grace are ye saved through faith and not of yourselves it is the gift of god, gift of god. not works yeah. lest any man should boast mm -hmm. wow. i mean that, so in other see, words oh go ahead there sorry we see we see that that there's nothing you could do before you get you get saved of confession repentance and being baptized there's nothing you could do i hear people say a lot of time oh i need to get my life in order before i get my life to christ that, that, don't, that don't work. <laughs> that, that don't, don't work. work. Because you you are a sinner. How could you how could sin how could a sinner with sin full of sin save themselves? How could you fix right. something that is is broken from childhood before you were even in this world? How could you fix that? Well, sin cannot count slow sin. Dion, before before you respond, I wanna answer that by yeah. going to question number four. Because this is going to right. segue us right into question number four. It says, "Whom did Jesus come to call to re Whom did Jesus come to call to repentance?" And I'm going to uh, read Matthew nine thirteen, the last portion of that text. Matthew nine verse thirteen, the latter part of that text, and it says, "For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance." So if you're trying to make yourself right, as Brother Colin <laughs> said in the beginning. You're trying to be God. You can't take. You're trying to take his <laughs> take his role. You listen. If he is calling all righteous, then I mean that's a different story. But he said I call, came to call sinners to repentance. Repent. That means you cannot yeah. make yourself right. That's like saying, listen, I know the hospital for sick people, but I know I don't feel well, but I can try to make myself well before I go to the hospital. Really? <laughs> <laughs> no, you go to the hospital because you're sick. So if Christ is calling yeah, right. sinners to repentance, 
then if you're right, then you don't need to go to Christ because you did something about Christ that you know you may pay for in the end. But but if you call and if you if you don't have no sin, which um first um the book of John tells us, I think it's first John, if we have if we say we have no uh, sin, we, we are alive. Yes. Yep. Yep. So, so we we know that if there's things that's wrong with us, we have to go to Christ. It's only him who cleanses us. He called us. Yeah. Uh, Romans 5 8 he calls us so he says come yeah. man come give me that give me that sin but why we don't want to hand it over <laughs> why we want to keep hey, that you know you, you know what I love about about God right God does not want to leave us in ignorance and for those who have not uh, consider searching out themselves to see how far they may be from God remember you read earlier Isaiah 59 2 mm-hmm our iniquity is separates us from God. Right. If we acknowledge that our iniquities are separated from God, right? There's one thing that God loves the most. And I want to read this text uh, that comes from Romans 3, 10, and 10 through 19. It's, it's so amazing. You just read that um, Christ came to call sinners, mm-hmm. not the righteous, right? Mm-hmm. I want to read Romans 3. It says, yeah. what then? Right? No, for, sorry, verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, no none. not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. Mm-hmm. They are all gone out of the way. Mm-hmm. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that do it good, no, not one. That's right. Their truth is an open sepulcher. We know what a sepulcher is. Mm-hmm. That's a grave. Mm-hmm. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of apps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. This is describing the world. Even mm-hmm. though this is describing God, uh, uh, the children of Israel, this is talking about the world, right? Mm-hmm. Their feet are just swift to shed blood. Destruction mm-hmm. and misery are in their ways. The way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And now we know that what things soever the law said, it said to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God God is saying you are so deep and dead in your sin Romans 5 18 5 8 yet I'm still gonna save you mm-hmm. wow <laughs> you he just described how crazy we are in sin we ain't even have God on our mind we ain't even seeking him he say I still gonna search out for you to save you Mm. I still search So God is saying, I come to seek you. You was the one who lost. You the one who's doing all of this dirt. <laughs> I, I want to mm-hmm. save you. Mm-hmm. If there was someone righteous on this earth, right? <laughs> Other than Christ coming, then would not that person uh take the place and die for us? Eh? Mm. Now you know I, the reason why I said is because going back at the beginning, I've heard many that say, you know, there were more than two people on this earth when God created. That there were like four four righteous people. But we have an account that there was two that sinned. So yeah. if there were two if there were two other people who have never sinned that then then that means they are righteous. Matter of fact, that means they could not die. Because the Bible tells us for the wages of sin is death. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if there are two righteous people living on earth, they could have never died. So why not God use those two righteous people to save the rest of the world if there are this if there were in the beginning two other righteous people living? Mm-hmm. But the fact is there was none. The Bible tells us sin came through one man right. into the world, and that's Adam. And so this is why Christ had to say, I come to save the lost. If you born from Adam, you lost. You were lost if you, if, if, if you are now in Christ. But if you came to Adam, you are lost. Mm-hmm. And so Christ came to give you this salvation, to give you this grace. That's Amen. the God we serve. Amen. I, I, I can come right in there and say, um, go to Romans chapter 10, verse 10. And I want to just want to say, go right back to what I'm going to help her just said. It says here in Romans chapter 10, verse 10. The heart, man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. This is what God wants us to do. He wants us to make, come to Him. 
that we can get salvation. And once we confess our sins, guess what? The doors have been opened to us. That's why he goes back to Revelation in chapter 3, verse 20. And he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. That's right. God wants to come into us. He wants to save us from the condition that we are already in. He says, Come at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come unto him. Okay. Let me help you. You don't have to stay there. I can save you. I can get you out of this mess. But all you have to do is open the door and confess and I will give you salvation. Amen. Uh -huh. Alright, and we're going to go into our final question on this subject for now. We're going to make a part two as we talk about repentance and confession. And the fifth question says, what leads a person to repentance? Uh, let's go to Romans chapter 2 and verse 4. Romans chapter 2 and verse 4. And it says, Or despises thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? So it, it tells us that According to this, to this text, it is God that gives us the ability to come before Him with our confession. And if the Spirit does not accompany that then, what kind of repentance do we do? Because sometimes some of us who may have children and they do something to one to the next one, and we say to them, say sorry to your brother or your sister. And they say, I'm sorry. You know, sometimes in the manner in which it's said, we think they're not sorry. But do you know that they're actually sorry? It's probably not leading to godly sorrow, but it's probably leading to sorry of, of regret of being caught or, you know, having been told to do something that they know they probably didn't want to do in the first place. And I think there is a passage of scripture that talks about godly sorrow or sorrowing after a godly sort. Because we find even when... Um, the Sanhedrin came looking after to find out who John the Baptist was. He told them to bring forth what? Fruit meat for repentance. Because he knew that as he called them brood of vipers. Why would he why would he say that? It, it never dawned on you why would he actually say that? <laughs> you know, they they must have been displaying the cat some characteristics that was not of the godly sort. And so when we're bringing forth fruits meat for repentance uh, if you think about a tree when you plant a tree you expect to get what with the type of whatever type of tree it is let's say a pear tree or a mango tree or oh, a mango yeah if we plant a mango tree right and we want we plant it because we want the fruit of it right so if we plant a mango tree expecting to get fruit from it we expect to get apples or we expect to get mangoes we expect to get mangoes mangoes yeah yeah. So, if if I'm bringing forth fruit of repentance, then it should be shown in the fruit. And I think we have a question relating to Judas, and I think it's gonna um, we're gonna answer that on, our, on on part two, on the other side of this discussion about Judas and him feeling sorrow and throwing throwing the money down in the temple um, on the ground because of what he had done, but. We, we have to make sure that when we wrong God, that the, the repentance there is not that of when, you're be, when you've been caught, like David with Nathan. Because if David was not caught, I don't think he would have probably at that point saying, you know what, you know, I feel bad, you know. You know I, this, this is wrong. And it's only God that, that, that sent Nathan there to intercept David before David dig a bigger hole for himself that he may not be able to come back from. Wow. I, I want to say something right here, but I didn't know a lot of things going through your mind as you were speaking. And one of the things that came to mind was Second Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10. And it says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance mm -hmm. to salvation. Not to be repented, but all, but the sorrow of the world, the world worketh death. Wow. So, what is, so you ask yourself, what is godly sorrow? And then you ask yourself, what work is unto death? The godly sorrow is that Jesus Christ has the penalty on the cross. Mm. He has died for our sins. Could you imagine that? The God is so, how could a man who we have turned ourselves, you no, know, I always think with Hosea and how his wife constantly betrayed him, constantly betrayed him, and God told him, go back. 
Mm. We are just like the children of Israel. We constantly go against God. We constantly go back God. And God constantly goes out and repeats for us. Constantly goes out. And then finally, He came on the cross and He died for us. Wow. Mm. And the punishment. God is so pierced the heart. It opened up your mind. Satan is willing to go this far to kill God's son who have done no wrong Amen. Mm -hmm. to save us. You know that, that sorrow of death to the world is guilt. Mm -hmm. Guilt. And that's one of the things that is killing our man today. Because they are not ready to profess their sins, the guilt mm -hmm. stays on them. Yeah. Pride. You know yeah. what I'm saying? The pride of life and all that, etc. The loss of that. Mm -hmm. I. It's because of these things that the world is not repenting. Mm -hmm. And that's the sorrow that is killing them. Mm -hmm. But if they seek that godly sorrow, if they open up their heart to the love of God, but what He have done for us and continue to do for us from the beginning to the end, that we may have life and we might have it more abundantly. Amen. <laughs> and on that note, um, Sister um, Brother Dion, we're going to. Um, let Sister Monica sing a song, and at the end, we're gonna have a prayer, and then we're gonna close out. Sister Monica. In times like these, you need a savior. In times like these, you need a Sure, be very sure your eye holds and grips the solid rock. This rock is Jesus, yes, He's the one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. Be be very sure, be very sure, your ankle and grits the solid rock. In times like these, you need the Bible. In times like these, oh, be not idle. Your ankle holds and grips a solid rock. In times like these, I have a savior. In times like these, I have an ankle. I'm very sure. I'm very sure my ankle holds and grips the solid rock. This rock is Jesus. Yes, he's the one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure. Be very sure your ankle holds and grips the solid rock. Let us pray. Heavenly Father in heaven, Lord, we just thank you so much that our anchors are, 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 are on Jesus. He is our rock the rock of our salvation. We look to him, O oh God, for all our comfort, for all the rest from sin and sorrow that he will give, because he takes it away. Behold, he is the Lamb of God that take it away, the sins of the world. We truly can put our trust and hope in him. Lord, we just pray and hope that our viewers, our listeners, their Lord have been blessed and that they have truly place their trust and hope in the man Christ Jesus Lord he is the one that can save us from sin because when he shall come he will come for those who have placed their hope and trust in him Father we thank you for each and every one of the panelists the panelists 
that have been uh, a blessing that father to our hearers we just pray and hope oh god that you continue to strengthen us that we can be able to be a blessing to our hearers once again we thank you for all you've done we pray in jesus name amen we thank you for tuning in to engage 2.0 remember to subscribe to our channel you can go to youtube type in heart number two heart 242 there you find all of our past material and also if you have any thoughts comments or questions please email us to um, at heart to heart ministries 242 at gmail.com once again that email is heart number two heart ministries 242 at gmail.com we thank you for all our listeners tuning in today at engage 2.0 and we pray that you will continue on with us as we will dive into this topic uh, in a part two repentance and confession as it relates to salvation but for myself for the ed and for the panel we say maranatha
Jazz and the River Jordan, or I'm sorry, one, when he died on the cross. And just like how you said that, where he wants to deliver us from death, from the power of Satan, it also tells us when you look at verse 15, it says, not just deliver them from, from death, but it says, and deliver them who through fear of death, 